right, here we go. I'm really excited for this. Kyle O'Reilly joining me here on the sessions. I'm so happy that this is happening. How are you me doing? Me too. I'm good, Renee. How are you doing? Really good. Thanks for having um, me on the sessions. Oh my God. No, thank you for being on the sessions. I wish that we could have done this like forever ago, but you're a busy guy. I mean, between your contract ending at WWE <laughs> to you joining AEW, then you have a baby like, holy, have you even like had a second to take in what has happened in the last like six months in your life? It's really been a whirlwind for these last six months. Um, since the baby's come, I've been off work for a few weeks and am off for a few more weeks. So it's kind of been the first chance for me to just take a breath and, you know, smell the roses a little bit. And I'm just, I'm so grateful for how fortunate I am and everything seems to be coming up, Kyle. <laughs> Yay, I know, honestly, like legit, much to uh, Orange Cassidy's chagrin, sucker. Yeah. Um, no, it, do you feel like you're actually taking time to smell the roses though? Cause as much as like, and I mean, John and I can kind of attest to that as well. When like, when he took time off and I had Nora that it's like, oh, okay, cool. We're going to like hunker down as a family for a second and like figure some stuff out. But it's like, everything is new. We knew nothing about babies. Did you know what you were getting into? Nothing. My baby <laughs> experience is little to zero. I so like, like just holding the baby at first was scary an experience so scary like I felt like I was gonna break her in half like she was just oh. this delicate little thing and I'm trying to hold her so gently and the nurse is like you need to hold her a little gusto like you know <laughs> use the backbone a bit and just they're a little more durable than we give them credit for and so I'm getting more of a grasp on handling her now and changing yeah. her and and calming her down but she's like legit only 17 days old we had oh our second uh pediatric appointment today so it's really, no, yeah, I'm not really getting much time to smell the roses, but I, I yeah. am to a certain degree in this business. Like you get a week off and it feels like a lifetime, right? That's actually true. Yeah. A week yeah. off is a little bit like, okay, like not that I know from this, but I can speak from a secondhand experience of like, all right, body's feeling a little bit better. Maybe you start yeah. watching some old wrestling videos, like things that mm -hmm. you haven't really had time for all those things. Um, talk to me about little Janie though. What has she been like? What is it like being a dad? Has it hit you yet? Did it hit you right away? Or it, did it, it take a second? No, it, it hit me right away. Uh, just, just a wave of emotion. Um, like we named her Janie after my mother who mm -hmm. passed away in 2017 and yeah. she wanted to be a granny more than anything else. And so it was kind of our way to to honor her legacy and, and to, to show tribute to her. And now it, the name is just so perfect. Like I can't imagine any other That's name beautiful. for her. And it's, she's just so amazing. And I just, I, I'm loving being a dad. And it's something I've always really wanted to, to be. I've always wanted to have a little girl. And I don't know, now that it's finally happened, it's, um, it's, it's really special. It's, very it grateful. really is surreal. And like, especially once like once you really start seeing their little baby personalities come out and you can see like even for me um it's funny I Becky Lynch was over here the other day and she's like oh I see some of your mom in her and I was like oh my I, wow. I tell my mom this and she's like oh my god amazing like mm -hmm. everyone wants to like have that little moment but it's really cool when you see different family members in your baby and you can see your family's bloodline with like your wife's family. It's, it's just such a trip to see. Um, and I love that you named your baby after your mom. I think that's really, really cool. I was doing like, um, I was doing a little bit of a deep dive before we hopped on here. And I found your post um, for mother's day when you were writing about your mom and what an eloquent writer you are. First of all, you're oh, really thank you so nice much writer. Yeah. It was, Oh, really I really cool. appreciate that. Yeah. It was really well written. I was like, do you have like, are you a ghostwriter for somebody? Like, look at you go. It, well, it's, it's something I've poetic. always had a passion towards like creative writing and writing short stories and stuff like that is something I really love to do. And I just don't give myself an opportunity to do so more. I like, I used to maintain a blog when I first left Canada and I was chasing this wrestling dream. I'm going to do this regularly. And I was pretty consistent with it for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know how things go. It's just hard to maintain, but yeah, I, I would really love to jump back into that and you know I, I definitely have a maybe a 10-year plan is to to write the next great American novel by a Canadian yeah. maybe one day yes. I could I, but I'd love the new fiction Douglas and Copeland stuff like yeah exactly <laughs> uh so you know maybe one maybe one day I could put more um energy into that but I appreciate you saying so 
Yeah. And I mean, it, it just gave me like a little bit of insight into more of like who you are, but also just being, it made me look at you not knowing your mother, but as your mother's son. I mean, somebody that, you know, you talk about her being a feminist and you talk about her being very into the earth and being a little bit of a hippie and just like being such a great mom. How much of that are things that you've already noticed yourself kind of leaning into with your daughter and with your mom being such a feminist? You said the way that she raised your sister and whatnot. Like how much of that do you think you feel in raising a daughter now yourself? Oh, so much of that. I feel just like a responsibility to if I can do half the job that she did as a mom raising Janie, then I've done an amazing job. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like she would always say, you know, there's no love like a parent's love. And like, I get that now. (laughs) Or like, you know, people would say uh, the feeling is indescribable when you have a a child and you look into her eyes for the first time, but it's so true. It's so cliche, but it's so true. Uh, And, you know, I'm just, I'm excited to watch her grow up and uh, you know, just for her to become this, amazing independent strong badass woman and oh, yeah. uh just to support her all the way and uh i'm really ex- i'm just excited to like interact with her finally at this point totally. it's just like uh, i know it's like drooling yeah. and eating and you know <laughs> and that but like i can't wait to, to the point where i can hear her laugh or something yes. like that you know uh so it's it's you know it's gonna be a it just started I've got 18 years left so i know <laughs> a lot no, longer it obviously but and honestly like back into like the cliches and everyone's like it goes by so fast and enjoy these moments like the fact that nora's already she's just about eight months she just her first tooth started to come through. oh my it's god like, oh my god who are you she's pulling herself up and she's gonna be walking before we know it it truly i feel like i just had her it's nuts um, but mm-hmm. it's it's really such a such a cool experience so i'm excited for you guys and also I've noticed um, also based off of your Instagram post that you are putting her on the path of success from a musical standpoint. You've been playing yeah. some good music for her. Sure. What are your go-tos right now? Because the ones that you listed have been aces. Um, I So I've got a bit of a, a vinyl collection that I've um, amassed over a few years. It's, it's amazing, but that's made such a great comeback. I, I love it. It's the best. Uh, I'm really proud of my Bowie collection. So I'm kind of Hell playing her some, some David yes. Bowie. I, I love David Bowie. Anything Are you like a that's... Labyrinth guy? Did you like Labyrinth? You know, it was kind of a little before my time. Um, You're not I... that much younger than me, first of all. <laughs> but okay. Yeah, you know, I, I, I appreciate it more now than I did uh, uh, growing up. Okay. Um, yeah, but uh, just, just you know, background noise at this point. I doubt she really recognizes any of it, but it just kind of sets the mood. And anything that just kind of is nostalgic that yeah. takes me back to me growing up. Like my mom played Bowie all the time. My dad played tons of like psychedelic rock. Like I got a ton of Pink Floyd albums that I'll play for her. The Mighty Led Zet. Like she's going to get that yeah. whole sort of experience. And then I'm sure once she's old enough to have her own opinion, she's going to say, this sucks, dad. Come on, put on, <laughs> put on like whatever the, the, the hot, hits are of 2035 but you, are, but you are giving her like a good foundation that she will still be able to come back to when she can appreciate it even if she yeah. turns her back on it for a minute the foundation has been set yeah you're doing yeah. right you're yeah, doing yeah. Right. or maybe like her boyfriend one day but like, your dad's really cool he's gonna see cool music and then she'll be like oh yeah my dad is cool <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly those are the guys that uh, we need daughters to bring home the ones that can make us feel cool again please. yeah exactly please 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 um okay so back onto the like the wrestling side of things wow How, can you believe that this is life right now that yes. things have gone the way that they have i mean when i was like you know, I always kind of keep like my finger on the pulse of what's going on in professional wrestling. I was like, wait, Kyle O'Reilly's contract is just coming up. Johnny Gargano's contract is just up. Adam Cole, like it's wild. I know. What happened? How, like, how did this happen? It beats me. I mean, when we were renegotiating, um, the powers that be were like, listen, this doesn't typically happen usually we, we re-sign guys six months out but mm-hmm. like the t- the t- talent relations at the time I guess let things slip or weren't as into re-upping NXT guys contracts is the only explanation I could give I I, I really don't know but um yeah. I mean I thought I had at least maybe six months to a year left it was a real surprise to me knowing that it was coming up in December a uh, pleasant surprise um you know just with the, the landscape and everything like it was uh-huh. it was really kind of a blessing that 
I was given the opportunity to make my own decision and to have like, I could stay, I can go. It wasn't made up for me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, like I yeah. feel for people who get released and everything and that happens way more than it, it should. I it's know. awful. Um, I was just grateful that I was, you know, in a position to where I can kind of look at the landscape and see what opportunities were out there. And luckily for me, um, AEW found a place and I was able to, to jump ship as it were. Yeah, it, it is really cool. Cause it's like, I mean, you look at your time at NXT and I mean, you really got to do it all and for you to be able to leave on your own terms. And I, I'm sure you left uh, in, in good graces and whatnot sure. that now for you to be able to go and be like, Hey, cool. I did all of the things there. Now let's pivot. Let's go over here and do this thing with all of your buddies. Like, I know it's nuts. That was a huge selling point too. Like the, the AEW locker room is full of the guys that I came up with in this business that I've been yeah. friends with for years. And there was a lot of that in NXT too, but it seemed like every couple of weeks you'd look around at the locker room just getting decimated. And it's yeah, like, I know. just not a, not a very good environment, I guess, at that time. And um, I just wanted to go follow my heart and go where I'm going to be happy and go where I'm going to be utilized. Like I yeah. felt, um, you know, to stay with WWE, it was, it was going to be to stay with NXT. And yeah. I was like, okay, well, at this point, after four and a half years, you don't really have a spot for Kyle O'Reilly on the main roster. I, I got the vibe that there wasn't going to be a spot for me up there. And it's rather so than bizarre. just kind of so it's tread so water. Like, it's weird. Cause I mean, I, I feel like I keep having these conversations and it's with guys like you, with guys like Adam Cole, like these guys that are those tippy top. These are the guys that you've all been investing your time in to put the company on the shoulders of, and yet we're not, there's no space for them what yeah, it's like just it's, different it's just philosophies odd. i guess yeah. different you yeah. know different directions and different ideas and it doesn't mean that one way is better than the other or one idea is going to make more money than the other it's well, just that's just I how mean, business goes yeah <laughs> right, right. No, you're i'm just right. so diplomatic about all this stuff and <laughs> you know, i just want, want everybody to do well and i want there For to sure. be jobs in wrestling and i want people yeah. to be able to go out and you know and it, like there's such a huge wrestling boom right now from independents to national companies to yep. whoever knows what's going to pop up next. I'm sure there'll be something great. And so it's just cool to see all the guys and girls that love this business have an opportunity to get paid, whether it's at that For top sure. level or at a lower level. Yeah. I was actually talking about this earlier today. I'm like, man, there is so much talent that are free agents right now or just amongst all of the other promotions and whatnot that like legit another promotion could like pop up. Like it's absolutely it's right. Nuts. Yeah. No. Like imagine that. Imagine yeah. Hunter just says, screw this. And he just goes and does his own thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. And it's crazy Fantasy because it's not outside him. the realm of possibilities. At this I know. Point. Like I wouldn't be surprised. We live in a world where Shane McMahon's getting released. I mean, everything's yeah. possible, right? It's, uh, it's is that all- legit? I don't know. I feel like the phrasing on that is probably not legit. I'm sure he's still, I don't know. He must be doing something within the company. Yeah, Maybe just not on right? the talent side. I don't know. Like you're not no allowed idea. at Thanksgiving anymore either. <laughs> like- <laughs> well, you know what? Who knows? Who knows yeah. over there what's going on? It's crazy. Um, okay. So what were the conversations that you were having um, while you were still at NXT, figuring out what you were going to do to, to make this move over to, to AEW? Um, everybody was really supportive. Um, like at the time Hunter had, was off with his health issues. So I hadn't had a chance yeah. to really see or talk with him. Um, but Sean had been super supportive and just, you know, you got to go where your heart leads you. And they understand that. And I yeah. think they could tell too, like, as much as we want you here, Kyle, we also want you to be successful. And Kyle O'Reilly as a character on NXT might not be super successful right now. Um, and that's cool. I mean, I'm happy to, to help guys grow. And, and yeah. I just wasn't ready at the point in my career where I was going to be a, a glorified coach, you know, where I was going to sure. be just training people. And I'm sure I would still had a spot on TV to some degree. But, you know, I wanted to go where the getting was good. And oh, yeah. AEW definitely has a lot of guys that I'd really love to work with and a lot of tag teams love work. and my tag partner is in AEW for one I know <laughs> oh Cole my god for one, how one of my best cool friends. was that for you to like have that happen on tv the way that it oh did. so cool and like they they played our old theme song yes. from Red Dragon uh from so cool. Ring of Honor in New Japan so it was mm-hmm. really cool too and that's kind of gave me like 
okay, well, there's definitely got to be a spot for me there. If they're, they're having Bobby come out to this song and they're yeah. talking about his tag teams, like past. And uh, so, I, you know, I figured maybe there was a shot there. And uh, wait, you had not even had conversations yet while, no. this, while this was sort of the narrative on television already. Right. Right. Wow. No, I, I hadn't. Yeah. Which is pretty wild. Uh, yeah. And it didn't really, it didn't really come like a deal didn't really get figured out until like the day before my debut either. So it's just crazy how fast things kind of happen in this business. Right. Oh my gosh. Yeah. As I was like, you know, I, I do most of my um, deep research on wikipedia.org. Um, and while I'm on there, I'm like, just, you know, you go, I mean, especially like somebody's like wrestling Wikipedia is like, they were here and here and this tag team and da-da-da and this promotion and blah, blah, blah. You have worked with everybody. Yeah. Who, I've had a lot of tag partners. Crazy. Yeah. Who, it's who been great. Who do you still want to work with? I mean, when you're looking at the roster of AEW and whether it's guys you have already worked with and you want to work with maybe this newer version of them yeah, uh, or guys that you've not been able to tangle it up with. Well, I broke in in 2005 and at the time, Brian Danielson was the ring of honor champion and was just on this legendary run. And he was coming up to BC to work quite a bit because he was still living in Washington at the time. And so I got to, you know, chat with him and train with him a little bit here and there, but I never had a chance to, to wrestle Brian. And he's a guy that I've literally wanted to wrestle my entire career. And we've sort of been like ships passing in the night, like every, you know, once I kind of leveled up to go to that next phase of my career, he was moving on to the next phase of his career, Yeah. this, that, and the other. And so now, you know, not to say that I left NXT to hopefully wrestle Brian Danielson, but you know, you got to go where the getting's good. And I felt there <laughs> yeah. was a chance. Maybe I could work this guy one day. Like it's so not like, I don't want to get too much into this conversation. Like it's kind of a private conversation that I had with Regal. So I was talking with Regal um, before leaving NXT and I'd mentioned this to him. Like, I don't want to seem like that guy that just wants to go somewhere to wrestle a guy, but he was like, no, I get it. Like when I left Britain, I just wanted to wrestle Ric Flair. I was like, really? Like, that's why you came to America? Yeah, but he was in WWF at the time. And I came to WCW, and then he came over to WCW, and I got to wrestle Ric Flair. I was like, oh, that's wild. Like, that's such a cool little story. That I hope he doesn't cool. mind me sharing uh, on yeah. the sessions. But, um, you know, so I, I really hope that I get a chance to wrestle Brian. And, uh, you know, there's a ton of young talent there that I think my style would mesh with really well. Mm-hmm. You know, a guy like um, Daniel Garcia and Lee Moriarty, like these guys that have a similar philosophy as myself yeah. in – the way they like to present their, their style of wrestling. And uh, I think that's really cool. And that's what's so cool about AEW. There is such a, a wealth of talent and a wealth yeah. of different styles. And it's just, I'm so excited to get back in there. And whether it's tag or singles, just to tear it up and, and do what I think I do best. And let's just shut up and wrestle. Um, and you do realize that there is something to be said for dad strength playing a role upon your return oh i'm gonna be so strong and like have a spider <laughs> sense like anytime someone's gonna trip or fall i'm gonna like dive to save them <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm, on uh, it. <laughs> I'm supposed to let you hit the ground <laughs> is there anything yeah. to your own style that you want to change or evolve or or, or kind of enhance upon now in AEW? um yeah i don't know i've always just been wanting to make just wrestling as realistic and believable as possible. And I know in 2021, that's a lot harder and harder to do. The cat's out of the bag. People know it's I not know, real. Right? <laughs> hey, hey, brother. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I just want to make, you know, I want people to watch my match matches and just to say like, and that was a good fight. Like it's hard to yeah. tell if those dudes really hate each other or if they're really going to town and, you know, just, uh, I just, yeah, I just really that's love to wrestle. Want. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He just wants to wrestle. Who are some of your guys? Who did you like grow up on just loving? I mean, I grew up absolutely loving that guy right here as Mr. Uh, Bret Hart. There he is. I mean, you as know, a Canadian, Canadian icon, boy, how legend. Could you, right? Right. How could you not love did the you, guy? You know, did you ever go through the dungeon? No, I didn't have didn't. the pleasure, uh, yeah. but I did. So do you remember when Bret was on that like uh, Canadian wide tour of Aladdin where he played the genie? <laughs> on the stage presentation yeah so like I went uh I went to see the show once I think maybe like right in grade 12 or something I love when there's um, a Canadian who says things like that I said something like that the other day like I was in like grade three grade yeah grade sorry what a weird like difference though why say it that way I don't know I don't know (laughs) (laughs) so anyways I was like um I'm gonna 
just say hi to him after the show or wait for him to leave or whatever. And uh, like, I didn't want, you know, there was a bunch of wrestling fans getting stuff signed and stuff. And I wanted to be cool, you know, to know that I just respected the business. And yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> hi, Mr. Hart. I just want to let you know, I just, I really love, you know, those matches you had with Davy Boy. And he just like, <laughs> he just looks off in the distance. Yeah, I was the best. <laughs> I was like, oh, all right. <laughs> live with the gimmick brother <laughs> i love it <laughs> Fred's the best oh yeah. my god it is but really I, funny when you think of those moments like when um and i hear these stories often when you're like not in the business but you're like kind of you're thinking about it and you have those moments and you're like how do i like play it cool so that they know i'm not just one of these like mark totally. fans i like know what i'm talking about <laughs> yeah exactly that was exactly it <laughs> <laughs> so funny so yes of course as a canadian you have to grow up loving bret hart um yeah. who, who else is on that list for you who's like your um your mount rushmore oh mount rushmore i mean i loved hulk hogan like my my first uh, memory associated with wrestling was that like at the video store and there was a poster of hogan tearing his shirt off and i would like go home and put like plastic safeway bags on my shoulders and rip them because that's the only way he could rip a shirt if it was made out of plastic right like it's the way it yeah, ripped, yeah. just looked like a plastic shirt so he was yeah. a huge <laughs> influence to me i mean the undertaker's up there because he was one of those characters that just took my just really made me believe I mean, it wasn't believable at all any of the stuff that he was doing but like as a kid when the whole undertaker killed your brother thing was going on with kane i was oh on and sinker like that was I he know. had superpowers he could make lightning hit the cameraman did you so, work with um did you work with Taker much at NXT? No, never no. had never had the pleasure. I mean, I got Dang. to meet he came by once and I, I got to meet him and, and yeah. chat with him a little bit, but no, never got a chance to work with him mm. at all. That would have been so cool. Yeah. Um, and then uh who else would I put up there? Um, I mean, I love Japanese wrestling. That's been a huge influence on me. So I'll say Toshiaki Kawada is a huge influence of mine just a guy that just sells his ass off i mean there's always that adage of oh they, nobody sells anything in japan these guys sell harder than anyone and like it's just because it's subtle and it's believable and he would just put so much into his mannerisms and then selling and, and i'll and i'll give honorable mention to terry funk because he's another guy i think he's selling is <laughs> just so yeah. funny and comedic but not at the expense of being serious or believable and right. uh, i just love everything about that guy and his legacy it's well. a good group. That's a good group right there. I like that. Um, I mean, you were such an athlete. I mean, okay. So I'm, I'm going to take things back to just like you growing up in BC, young, sweet boy. When sure. like, you, you kind of did everything, you played hockey, you played rugby, you were into like d different mixed martial arts. How did yeah. you tell me about all of the sports? That so, you were yeah, and, like, I mean, what you kid... gravitated towards. And a kid, as a kid in high school, I played all the sports, you know, I did the rugby, football, lacrosse, hockey, all that, but I was really like, you know, I was in the drama club too. I went out for the school plays and the school musicals and it found this Wait, love are, for you the can theater. Do musicals? Okay. So this is a scoop <laughs> that I don't think anybody else knows about me. And it's okay. probably going to be all online after this, but so my grade 10 production of Greece, I played Danny Zuko. Oh my God. The lead. <gasps> so kind of a funny story behind it. Um, this girl that I had a crush on at the time, she had an amazing voice and she was like the front runner to play Sandy. And in my mind, I'm like, what a perfect icebreaker. If I went out, I got the role of Danny. I mean, I'm in. That's, so, I mean, there's literally films made about this of like, well, I got to be in the play so that I can hook up with the girl I that I like. I know. <laughs> I'm such a hopeless romantic too. And I like, I went and like for my audition song, I sang the, um, uh, the Mr. Burns cover of Be Our Guest, See My Vest. <laughs> But I'm not a good like singer. My like I've got a tin former gophers. <laughs> gophers. It was that skin my chauffeurs, but a greyhound for a tuxedo would be best. Okay. Oh my but god, that's what here. a weird choice. That's so funny. <laughs> Just because it's the only song I had like memorized that I could <laughs> couldn't butcher. You can't butcher that song. It's so easy. Uh, so lo and behold, I get the part. And okay, so like now I'm actually really putting myself out there. You know, I'm gonna be in a play where I'm singing. And, um, yeah, I, oh yeah. And in the, in the, the theater version of Greece, uh, Greece lightning is a Kinnicky number. So I didn't get to sing the cool song. I was so pissed. Oh my God. Did you get to wear <laughs> leather pants at least? Did you get to wear yeah. like the outfits? Oh, I had the outfit, the mm -hmm. hair, um, 
what yeah, happened the singing, with the girl? dancing, all that. Yeah, she dumped my ass going into the, our senior year. <laughs> Grindel, broke my heart. Oh, it, was, yes. it, was, oh my it hurt God. real bad. But it all worked out for the best. And yeah. I just, of course, I became a pro wrestler because theater and being an athlete in sports, I mean, it's, it's those worlds mesh together. That's what pro wrestling is. It's four-sided theater with ropes, essentially. Uh, so I think that's kind of where a lot of, I can kind of explain sort of everything about me. Yeah. And then I just, I just found a total respect and love for, for performing and, and the whole, like just the art form of it all and the, and the performing arts. And I had an amazing drama teacher and just really, and my sister was into all that stuff and she really inspired me to chase that as well. And just not, and not to have any shame. Cause as a kid, like you're on the sports teams or oh, you're going into the play. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this guy's in the play. Yeah. Yeah, hell yeah, I'm in the play. I loved it. So it's um, so funny. I was I was kind of drew that comparison as well because I sort of roundaboutly, like through happenstance, wound up in professional wrestling. But like I had studied acting and I was doing acting classes and taking voice lessons and all of those things. Like that's what I was so drawn to. But I also played a ton of sports growing up. And then I was working for a sports network and I'm talking sports. So then when I wound up in WWE I was like perfect fit it's all the things that I love all yeah. under one roof and it's yeah it's it's crazy how like you don't think of, like at the time I would have never thought that all of those paths would have led me to this one thing but then lo and behold it all just kind of sinks up in right one place it's and so cool. when when NXT got its TV deal there was a compare there was something that Hunter said that I loved when he compared NXT to the main roster and he said NXT was like the Broadway show. It's where the, the real performers get out there. They got the chops, they can act, they can sing, they can dance, they can do it all. And there's, there's no, like, there's no special effects. There's no big budget blockbuster movie special effects. That's hiding it all. Like a raw or SmackDown would be. I just thought that was such a great analogy that is really cool. and really rang true. Uh, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, no, I, that I remember Hunter saying something like that before, like reading something about that and hearing that analogy. And I, I thought that that was a really cool, uh, idea as well and I, I really do think like that that's what hunter was really trying to achieve with nxt and it so. does it, it's sad to see that uh go away because I, I do really mm -hmm. feel like he was onto something with that and there really was a heartbeat to what nxt was absolutely um, yeah uh so i mean yeah with you having this like musical theater background and this like big fun personality you're so serious in your in as like Kyle O'Reilly do you feel like yeah. there's ever that part of this version of you that wants to like bust out I think there's a little bit of it um that kind of would pop out in in situations where I'm comfortable I guess like when mm -hmm. when the Undisputed Era was just this gang of douchey frat boys where I could kind of <laughs> throw myself out there and be that kind of goofy yeah. kind of guy but so much of wrestling is kind of I guess we all have anxieties and confidence issues and so much of wrestling is just yourself dialed up to 11 yeah. and it's I guess still hard for me to really to be Kyle O'Reilly Kyle Greenwood even if it is an elevated version of him mm -hmm. whereas you know if like I was a Danny Zuko I'm just playing a character so I can just sure. go all in on this guy and and yeah. just make it as fun as possible right uh yeah, maybe, I guess. I'm still trying to find that balance. Like so much of wrestling is throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. Sure. And I still, don't, I still don't think I found the formula of what this finished product of Kyle O'Reilly is going to be. Um, this forever is going to be a work in progress. Um, of course. And I mean, you yeah. still have, like, you've got so much of your career still ahead of you. And it's fun to think of what those moments of discovery are going to be, or like what these evolutions of what Kyle O'Reilly are going to be. And that, yeah, that's still ahead of you. That's really yeah. exciting. And it's exciting to like acknowledge that instead of being like, Oh, I, instead of like the other way around of like, in hindsight, I wish I had done this. I wish I could have, you know, done X, Y, or Z that you still have that all laid out in front of you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's neat. Um, so, okay. So within the, within the AEW landscape, within like the tag division, what do you want to do in there? I want to do it all. You know, there's, there's so many rematches that we can do. Excuse me. My stomach is rumbling kombucha. Um, <laughs> I, I couldn't it, hear it, but I'm glad. To okay. Know. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, the young bucks are a team that Bobby and I have, have fought literally all over the world um and it's been a few years since that's happened so that of course is going to happen uh the lucha bros mm -hmm. ftr is another rematch i mean we did one in nxt that we really had great chemistry with those guys and again 
in the same vein, similar philosophies and, and similar styles, just a hard hitting, you know, just vigorous wrestling style, I guess. Yeah. Um, you would love to, to take that match back. Um, the, uh, uh, Jurassic Express is another match. I mean, the, the private part, there's so many great tag teams there. There really is. Yeah, Who knows? Lot. Are Brian and Mox going to be a tag team now? Please. We don't know. I, I please, was watching please. and I was like, wait, is this happening? Cause I, I know. like this a I lot. I like it too. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like it's, it's really going to fit well. So that's a mat. That's a dream match right there as well. Oh my God. I know. I, I gotta have a little chat with this man and be like, listen, yeah. I think that you should accept this offer from Brian Danielson and we should, we should really flush it out. Seems yeah. like a good idea. I like it yeah. a lot. Um, so back to my, um, Wikipedia, um, research it says that you were billed from Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. When, when were you billed from Cape Breton and what is your tie <laughs> like to when Cape I, Breton? When I first broke in, they were like, Oh, we, <laughs> uh, our, my wrestling trainer, Michelle Starr was like, all right, we need names and we can't just, uh, cause it was like the day before our, maybe a day or a week before our debut, uh, show, which is going to be a battle Royal. And, you know, we, we need you guys to have names. You can't just be, be out there, Kyle Greenwood from Vancouver, BC, you know? So I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess that idea is. <laughs> so gonna, <laughs> That's what I was bringing so, to the yeah. table. All right. Yeah. Oh, uh, O'Reilly is a, um, it's a family name. It's like okay. my mom's granny's, granny's maiden name. So a few generations back, it's in, it's in yeah. the line. Okay. And um, Cape Breton, I don't know why. I think I maybe read a book. And the main character was from Cape Breton. And I just thought it had a cool name. Uh, I've never even been to Nova Scotia. You uh, haven't? So, no, oh my gosh. I know. I know. And, What's the um, farthest east you've gone in Canada? Uh, Toronto? I haven't even been to Quebec. Wow. I know. You, how I have you never wrestled in Quebec? I know. What? I, I know. Well, there was a time, like, when I finally made it as a up-and-coming sort of name on the independence, I was living illegally in the states and i was not going to risk crossing the border because True. it was just going to get some jerk having a bad day to google my name and ban me yep. for five years so i'm yes. you know i'm just going to stay here until things work out how scary is that how so scary, scary are those moments of like just let me slide under oh, the radar i'm just trying sure. to work and trying to and it's it's rough because when you're in canada it's I, it's funny i always feel like i want to have these conversations because i don't feel like people understand the difficulties of being like even though it's just canada it's really difficult to try to work in the United States when you don't have your Extremely. proper visa and trying to get an O one visa as like the entertainer's visa. It's like, Oh yeah, oh, for my sure. God. It's crazy. I got denied. I got denied an O visa. I got denied a P visa, like just repeatedly trying, throwing so much money at it, just getting denied, denied, denied. And like eventually just came to a point where I just can't risk it. Like I would go maybe uh, see some family or, spend a couple months I would go back home and, and work for a few months just yeah. to make some money yeah. um, so I could afford to, to fund this dream and it's, the entire it's so time expensive. it's so expensive back home it's so expensive right it's all so expensive well first of all oh. back home is so expensive and it's like even worse right now like oh my god my mom keeps telling me like the prices of things and it's wild yeah. um but even just like, like getting the visas and stuff. Cause I remember being in a situation like that too, when I was in Toronto and I was like, okay, I just want to like go work in the States. And I had moved to the States illegally as well. And I was like, Hey, you can stay for like, whatever it's like the six months and you've got to go back to Canada and then you can cross the border again, like trying to do that for a while. But when you're doing that illegally, yeah, you're always kind of waiting for that other shoe to drop. Am I going to get in trouble for this? Yeah. How can I stay afloat? But I had tried to get an O one visa and it got denied and I did not have the $5,000 to pay for that at the time. So when it's just like on my credit card, I'm like racking oh, up this debt. And it's like, oh my it's God. It's so brutal. It's like, just throw me a bone universe. But Jeez. then you think about all the times where the universe did throw me a bone and all True. the times that I did make it through the border. Yes. No problem. And did get like a, a lucky break here and there. Like yeah. it really felt like the universe was doing everything it could to make this happen for me yeah. as well as, as many difficulties and, and obstacles are in the way, like all the anxiety, anytime you go home is just the anxiety building up. Like you knew you were going back to the States on October 4th, oh. just build, build, build. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to have to cross the board. Like it's unnecessary oh, fear I know. for a kid it's, just chasing his anxiety, dream. thinking about it. I'm totally. like, oh God, I'm so glad <laughs> those days are behind me. I know. I know. And oh, someone actually gosh. wanted to ask you about maybe you could always cut it. I was going to ask you off the record, but is, should I get a citizenship? 
Like my yes. daughter's American. Like I just don't want to get rid of my Canadian passport. That's like document to. gold, you know? No, you I have agree. to? No, you don't have to. Oh, you don't have you don't have no. to. You don't have to. No. So what happens? And I think this is fine to talk about anyway. So you go in. I'm glad that I did my citizenship because, uh, yeah, it's like doing all the paperwork. My my daughter is American. My husband is American. Is your wife American? Yes. OK. Yeah. See, that's how I'm here now. Green card. Right. <laughs> yes. Well, it's funny. I actually got my green card be- just before John and I got married. Um, but then I did my citizenship based on us being married. So once you've been okay. married for three years, then you can apply for your citizenship where if it's oh, just okay. off the green card and off your work, it's five years. Um, so I'm glad that I did it. Cause yeah, I'm like, I'm just sick of doing the paperwork and that anxiety of like, Oh my God, I've got to apply for my visa again, or I've got to apply for this thing X, Y, Z. So anyways, you go in to do it and you like, you know, you essentially denounce your Canadian citizenship. Like you verbalize that of like, I, you know, America is my country. We probably have to cut this part. Um, but yeah, you say like, yes, America is my country, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but you don't have to get rid of your Canadian citizenship or anything because when you are born a Canadian, they will always recognize you as a Canadian citizen. Okay. So you, you can still use all of that stuff. So what about reapplying for a, a new Canadian passport as an American citizen? You have to cross that bridge, I guess, when we get Shit, there. <laughs> I didn't think about that. Oh gosh. Yeah, maybe not. I didn't think about that. Probably know. not. I don't know. Shoot. I'll look mm. into it as the okay. American. I'll look into it for <laughs> yeah. us. I'll do a little deep dive and see what happens. Okay. Yeah, I have no idea how that goes, but um, like I totally want to become a citizen, like to, to, to vote and stuff. That's important, sure, right? Of course. And of my course. daughter is American. Like that's I would hate Especially to be deported for whatever years. reason. Yeah. To, oh my God, imagine. But I want to have the. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. But to have like that, re- like to, the lifeline of, if shit really hits the fan, we can pick up and go to Canada. Then that's a nice luxury as well (laughs) no like honestly and the like for the from the voting aspect definitely in the last like you know four to eight years has been like man I feel so helpless just kind of sitting here there's nothing I can do but you know talk a little shit internally because you can't really say anything I'm not I wasn't a citizen at the time um yeah but yeah, having that like fallback plan of like, well, I mean, if we need to run back up to Canada, like, especially when all the COVID stuff happened, there was definitely a time where I was like, man, what I would give to just, can we just move to Banff and call it a day? Right. Like, get me out to that fresh air, a little Lake Louise action. I'm done. No kidding. Canada is so expensive though. Holy shit. It is. It's obscene. Uh, my know. sister was down here for Christmas and uh, my brother and my sister came for Christmas and they hadn't been to Florida yet since we'd lived here. Yeah. And they were just, their minds are blown in the grocery store. Like what? This costs it's all hundred bucks. It's been like 500 bucks in Canada. It was I like know. two for one on beer. I've never in my life seen two for one on beer. <laughs> <laughs> like what? Are you Getting kidding? it away. We're yeah. Getting it all away. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty wild. Um, what, what, so what else did you like? What was, what was life like for you growing up in Vancouver, British Columbia? Cause as much as I'm a Torontonian, Vancouver is the most beautiful part of Canada. It's stunning. It is really beautiful just to be that old growth, great Pacific rainforest Mm -hmm. is just so amazing. And the mountains are there like, and then you have this urban environment of the city right next to it attached, like growing up, lots of camping trips, fishing, snowboarding, that stuff. And it's just all part of your backyard. Like it's within a couple hour drive, even less, you know, um, I mean, we always went camping in a place called Sasquatch Park. Oh my God, I, that would be John's dream. He's a Sasquatcher. Oh yeah. He yeah. loves that shit. I love it too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. I just dig. Like, there's a whole like community surround based off of Sasquatch lore. It was oh so amazing gosh. with a big, a big statue of him in the town square. And there's a really cool book. Shit, I just finished reading it not that <laughs> long ago. That. Um, Oh my God, I'm going to draw such a blank on it right now, but thank God Emilio's an editing wizard. It's um, Max, shit, hold on. I got to look this up. It's it's a Sasquatch book, uh, but it's like, hold on. Sasquatch book, Max. I can't think of what the, De-Evolution by Max Brooks, Mel Brooks' son wrote it. Oh, okay, yeah. It's so cool, but it takes place in like the Pacific Northwest area and like a volcano yeah. has erupted that has been lying dormant for forever. And all these Sasquatches start coming out of the woodwork. It's a very cool book. He wrote World War Z too, didn't yes. he, Max Brooks? Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Good author for yeah. sure. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so you grew up in the Pacific Northwest. I know that uh, also in the the thing that I had read that you wrote for Mother's Day, talking about your mom, talking about her taking you to Seattle for WrestleMania. Yeah. What was that like? Who was on that card? Do you remember? That was um, Angle Lesnar was the main event. It was Hogan versus McMahon, 20 years in the making with oh the gosh. return of Rowdy Roddy Piper. And I had a dream the night before that Rowdy Roddy Piper came back and I can't explain it how I was like I woke up like man, I dreamt that Piper Termination. came back and then forgot about it he came blew my mind uh and then Sean Whoa. versus Jericho on that card which is one of the best live matches I've ever seen in my life uh-huh. but just the, the experience Wrestlemania as a you know a 15 year old for the first time going to a big event in a different city and you know my mom she took me and my buddy Sean and Buzz down and dropped us off Buzz. and we went to the casino <laughs> and killed a few hours <laughs> <laughs> And then we met it back up with her, but it was just such a, an amazing, profoundly, um, just a profound experience for me, just influential, you know, like it was just one of those, everybody has that moment where they know they want to be a pro wrestler. And I'd had that moment long before that, but it was just like, just the spectacle of it all. I can just, uh, I can close my eyes and, and, and remember everything about it. At what point did becoming a professional wrestler start to feel like a reality? Not even just like this, like hoop dream, but like, oh shit, I'm actually going to be able to go and do this. Yeah. Basically like right out of high school, I joined a local wrestling school. Um, there's a local company, um, <clears throat> where I'd like go watch, uh, independent shows. And my friend, Sean and I, we'd been like best wrestling friends for the longest time. Like from two, di- like he lived like two towns over and we played on the same football team. So we became friends, but like, we just had this common interest that was wrestling, but like our, and we were totally different kids and different like uh groups of friends and everything but the one thing we had a shared interest in was wrestling and my parents and his parents totally fostered that and like encouraged that and always drove us no matter how long it took to get to each other's houses they would take us there so we could hang out and be wrestling buds and we joined wrestling school together and like I mean I I felt like like a like a fish to water like as soon as I got in that ring I just felt natural and like just the rolling and the bumping just came to me so well and you know I'm still green as grass don't get me wrong but I don't know. It just felt right. And it felt like this is if, even if I never made a dime in wrestling and if I was still uh, doing independent shows once a month, I I would still be doing it with all of my heart and soul because that's Mm -hmm. really where, you know, my passion does lie. And uh, I'm just, I'm fortunate that it did work out and I am making a living now, but it's one of those things that you just, I think people in wrestling are really rare in the sense that like, you really, really have to love it. And I think that might be an underlying problem in this new NXT. Like there's a lot of people coming in that I don't think really have that true love for it. And I'm sure they'll do well and they'll make a big splash and be a big star and make a ton of money. But like at the end of the day, if your heart isn't really in it, like, I don't know, it's, it's too much work. It's too much work for you to it's not so hard. be emotionally invested in. I mean, with the ups and the downs and the good and the bad and things going your way, things not going your way. I mean, it's so crazy when you can see somebody having a gigantic push within a company, but at a certain point there, there always will be lulls throughout a career where you're kind of like, what am I doing? What am I going to do next? And that's got to be something that you need to learn how to weather throughout your career. And yeah, if it's something that if it's not your complete passion, I can't imagine somebody wanting to be along for a ride like that. Right. Especially, okay, one or two years. Yeah. But when it's been like a decade and you're still just grinding and getting beat up every single day and everybody hates you. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. I know it's pretty nuts. Like, like even just like thinking of like, I I was, it it always kind of pops in my mind when I'm like talking about stuff like this, like talking about like what this NXT 2.0 was, but like that line of like, we don't want to hire indie wrestlers anymore was just like what yeah like it we don't want pro wrestlers was something yeah. i heard and i was yeah. like okay well i am a pro wrestler and i want to yeah. be a pro wrestler still so i'm gonna go where i can be a pro wrestler and yeah. i know the the things are the same sports entertainment wrestling it's all the same whatever but i don't know if everyone looks at it that way yeah yeah no i know and uh i mean whatever to each their own. The good thing is yeah. there's all the different platforms, all exactly. the different promotions. So if they want to go do their thing, you can do your thing. Everyone has their lane to stay yep. in and, uh, and hopefully thrive within that. Um, what have been some of the conversations that you've had with, with Tony Khan since, since being at AEW? Just such a, you can tell that he really, really cares about this. And for a guy that has so much going on, you know, 
with AEW, with the Jaguars, with, with uh, Fulham, like the guy is working so much. Oh my God. And when does he to sleep? Still, Legit. When does he sleep? And for him to still give me the time of day and to really like genuinely look me in the eyes and give me a like, straight up answer and to be mm-hmm. enthused about me and my family growing, like, and to no. him to really genuinely care about that, like, that's, it's pretty special. And He's so sweet, like, sweet he really is. And when you have a boss like that, you want to go to war for them. And uh, so I'm very motivated to, to get back in there and to really, like, I've only had one match since being there. So I yeah. feel like I haven't even scratched the surface and showing him, you know, what I can bring to the table. So I look forward to, to showing him that he made the right call and bring yeah. him over. Yeah, it's very exciting to like, imagine you like getting back there and now like really getting into the mix. Cause yeah, it was like, the excitement of like, oh shit, Kyle O'Reilly's here. Amazing. Yeah. And then, you know, you got to step in and, and do dad mode and, and be there with your wife and your baby. Um, yeah. But I, I know people are going to be very, very excited to, to see what you bring to the table and see what some of these matches are um, that we can get out of you. <laughs> totally. um, okay. Going back to, I'm, I am all over the place, but no, like, anyways, all, when okay. you were a child and you did this and by the way, yeah. and this thing you did last week, tell me about that. <laughs> um, I want to, I want to talk about the diabetes stuff a little bit. So when yeah. you, when, when did you first get diagnosed with diabetes? So I was like, like less than a year into wrestling. I was 18. Wow. Which, um, yeah, I like just started having matches and, um, I was trying to get licensed for Washington state because they had a wrestling a commission, an athletic commission that you needed blood work for and everything. And regular check. I mean, I, something was definitely up for a while. Like I was really sick and uh, I'd lost a ton of weight and like, mm-hmm. there just wasn't enough water in the world to satiate my thirst. And uh, yeah, we knew something was really up just, you know, ple- pleading ignorance and just if, if I ignore the problem, I'm sure it'll go away. And then lo and behold, they diagnosed me on the spot because like, yeah, blood sugar levels were through the roof and um, you know, they're, they're towing that line, the doctor's line, like this wrestling thing, you got to stop and whatever, whatever. But yeah, it's just something that you, I have to adapt with. And I, you know, I just took it in stride and okay, this is my new life. This is everything that I have to do to stay healthy and to stay on top of my health. And in the end, it's kind of made me more accountable for my own health. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, don't get me wrong. It's a, it's a brutal physical and mental grind that never ends. Like each day it's constant. Like I'm making, uh, decisions on my medication that literally could mean life or death in one moment you know um but like yeah it's but it's just I don't know it's just something that I I'm used to now and I've had a a huge support system and Mm -hmm. like which is huge for maintaining diabetes type 1 diabetes what's the difference between type 1 and type 2 uh so type 1 is essentially my pancreas just completely shuts down it's an autoimmune disease and I produce zero insulin type two is more when like you know your great aunt's diabetes where she's she is she doesn't take care of herself and she doesn't have the best diet and she's gained a lot of weight and so her pancreas is kind of hanging on so she takes a pill and then she can keep having her soda pops and everything's okay but like with type one you have to take the needle yeah yeah, type one is is constant insulin injections and the insulin i use it's like with every meal I take insulin. Um, I have a CGM on my arm, which is amazing technology that I've just had since probably about going on two years, which has changed my life. Like I can look at my phone and in real time, see which direction my blood sugar is trending in, which is a luxury I never had before. Like I would have to finger prick my finger and test my blood manually like eight times a day. And it's just, it's just, it's brutal. It's a brutal grind. But what I would, what I mean by the medicinal life or death decision is like, insulin comes in in units right so if i take say if i have a banana i probably need two or three units of insulin but say if i took three units of insulin but only ate half that banana then i might end up in a coma and i might not pull through like it's the smallest like little bit of insulin can literally mean life or death and it's kind of scary and i've had a couple close calls um but you know you stay on top of these things and uh I'm just grateful that I have a support system and I get to do what I do for a living. How does it affect you as an athlete? It's yeah. It's, I think like the traveling athlete makes it more difficult because you're in different yeah. time zones and your body is thrown off and you don't know where exactly the next meal is going to come from or if it's going to be healthy enough. And um, 
and stress and anxiety as, it plays a huge role as well. Like, and in this business, there's no shortage of that. Oh my gosh. So right? <laughs> like the cortisol levels and the stress hormone that gets released, like my insulin doesn't really work as well. So on days where like I have a lot going on, it's just like a TV day. My blood sugar just runs high and, but I'd rather it run high and kind of how just do you feel, feel, how do you feel when it runs high? Is that what makes you, it, does that make you yeah. shaky? It, it certainly can. Um, yeah. If it's too high, it makes you really exhausted. It makes you really thirsty. It makes you tired and lethargic. And, but like, if it runs high, you can kind of get by, you can let it run high and it's not going to kill you immediately. Whereas if it goes, drops too low, like your brain runs on glucose, right? So if your yeah. body, if there's no glucose in your blood, that brain's going to shut off and that's when it gets really scary. So on show days, I just let it run, run a little high and I'm not too worried about it. I run high insulin doesn't work super great anyways on those days. And then as soon as my match is done, it's like clockwork. Like suddenly my insulin works and my blood sugar starts coming down and then it levels out and it's totally wow. fine. But on, on, when I'm wrestling, I just rather it run high and not risk letting it go low because then it yeah. can get really scary and dangerous. Yeah. I remember my, one of my, uh, like my like boyfriend in high school, his dad and his sister both had diabetes. And I remember there being times when um, if their blood sugar got too low, his dad being like almost seeming like, like blackout drunk a little bit of like, yeah. whoa, like you could just see that he was like a different person all of a sudden or like right. his, his sister would just like shut down. Like you got to get them some juice right away. Like yeah. it can be really scary if you're not prepared for what that looks like. So Absolutely. I mean, a blessing in disguise. I mean, I'm not even in disguise, but like that you had to go through the commission in Washington state to, to find that out. Cause I mean, what, what, what could have happened if you had not actually got it looked at at that point most people when they get diagnosed they get hospitalized because it just goes too high for too long and they go yeah. into ketoacidosis diabetic ketoacidosis mm -hmm. and so your body is essentially just withering away it's it's eating itself for energy because it's not pulling anything from the blood into the cells you can't get the yeah. glucose into the cell like insulin it's the the transport hormone it basically takes glucose and puts it into the cell and without that then the sugar just builds up in the blood whatever um so yeah, like there's a little boy that just from Toronto uh, that just sent me an email or his dad sent me email on his behalf and he was just diagnosed. He's eight years old. He's in a hospital mm -hmm. and just said like, you know, we totally find inspiration from you and everything you're doing. And thank you so much. And it just, oh, that every time, anytime I hear that, mm -hmm. it just, it gets me. And so I just, I try and do what I can to, to give back to the people like that and, um, you sure. know, send them a little letter back and a little trading card or whatever, but yeah. you know, it's, I no, can't it's imagine sweet. being a kid and having to go through that. Like I was, I was a grown ass man. I was 18 years old. Like I've got no excuse not to man up and just take full responsibility and then do yeah. what I can to be healthy. But it to can be like kind of hit you at any point, right? It totally can. It totally. And that's a misconception of diabetes. Oh, you gave it to yourself. Did you eat too much sugar? And like, no, that didn't do anything. I was a healthy yeah. kid that played an athlete. I just, it's a, it's a autoimmune disease. There's nothing I could have done to prevent it. Yeah. Um, what, yeah. I've what is your diet thought. like now? Or what's like your, what are your go-tos? What does your diet look like? I kind of just eat to manage my glucose and just eat as healthy as I can. Um, yeah. I don't really like count or, or make things too strict. You know, I want to enjoy life as well. And I loved eating. I love cooking. I love food. So I, I treat myself certainly. Um, but yeah, as long as I can just take the right amount of insulin and I, I know kind of what's in there, I can get by. What? Uh, Cause you used to be a cook, right? At a restaurant. Yeah. True. You, you ever eaten at Earl's? I love Earl's. I worked at Earl's for like, like basically that whole period uh, of starting wrestling until leaving the States. And then when I would come back home and they would keep my old job for me at Earl's. So I learned so much about the kitchen and, yeah. and cooking so many life skills that I, I've maintained to this day um, from working there. I'm, I'm grateful for having that experience started as a, you know, a dishwasher and moved my Everyone way up. Everyone should every... work in the service industry. In some Absolutely. Capacity. And they don't you get enough to. credit. You don't agree because it is such a, a, it's a very difficult job. It's really, yeah. and you don't get enough credit and it, you're working late nights and early mornings and it's a tough, thankless job, mm -hmm. but man, I loved it. And I really got a lot out of working there. And now I'm just obsessed with, um, cooking and, and the presentation is where it's at Renee that's where I really yeah, shine oh, listen I know <laughs> you gotta yeah. get it you can't be a slouch if you're putting no. in the effort in the kitchen let's make it look nice let's make the presentation you worthwhile you got it my wife's always like oh is it ready like I'm, hang on let me plate it please like yeah I like 
got to make the mashed potato mountain and then you put the the slant cut green onions on top and, oh it's not pointing up gotta uh. so yeah i'm obsessed <laughs> with the, the presentation and all the culinary shows i i love like the chopped and the beef bobby oh flays <laughs> beef bobby flay i'm obsessed with i can't believe so there's good. like 36 seasons of that show i, know. I love that show so much he's if you so were good. to go on beef bobby flay what would Ooh. be your go-to meal that he's got to try oh. to make that? i make a pretty good like korean beef and bop bowl Ooh. like a nice marinated bulgogi and like uh-huh. bunch of fresh veg and stuff and like that's where presentation that nice. really comes into play on one of those guys lots uh, of colors a lot of color yeah uh-huh. and if you get like a nice cut of, of steak and it just melts in your mouth and you get enough time to marinate it it's really good uh but yeah i, I i'd love to uh, actually check out your cookbook uh, you must, you simply yeah. must. I'll send you one. I will, uh, I'll send one with John to TV for when you're back at oh, TV. I'll, I'll send one your way. That'd be definitely. so cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, cause yeah, you got to check out my playlists that are on there too. I feel like you would appreciate my playlist. That awesome. Like that. Totally. Yes, definitely. Um, okay. So Valentine's day is just around the corner. You mentioned that you are, um, a bit of a hopeless romantic. Mm-hmm. What's your plans? Cause you not only have to treat your wife, but she is now a new mom and her body's probably torn up. I've been yeah. there, girlfriend. I know what she's yeah. going through. What's your plan? So growing up, my Valentine's Day was my dad's birthday. So we oh. never really celebrate a Valentine's Day. It was always just <laughs> dad's birthday. And every yeah. year my mom would make him like a heart-shaped chocolate cake. It was just the sweetest oh, thing. Oh, that's cute. So I might make her like a little cake or something. But I got, um, I kind of celebrated a little early. I got her a, um, the January birthstone is the garnet for Janie obviously and I got her a really cute little ring um, with a garnet on it and like some sapphires and stuff and it's for it's for Erica but when Janie's 18 and graduates high school she can give it to her and uh (laughs) So he's that's kind thought of thought ahead, you guys. He's <laughs> already thought far ahead. And I love things like that because I am all about a good keepsake like that as well. Yeah. I love when things can be passed down. I don't and not in like a bougie way of like I don't want like cheap jewelry. Trust me, I buy plenty of cheap jewelry, but I do like when it's a thing that can be passed along and there's like a story behind mm-hmm. it. Oh my god. Yeah. And great. like my mom had a, a ring with all our birth like my dad, hers, mine and my sister's birthstones on it. And she gave it to my wife when, you know, she passed away and stuff too. And so she has that. And then I got like a special one for, for our baby. And yeah. So I, I assume that. it's going to be a one and done. I don't think we're, we're planning on having any more kids, but. Okay. Um, well, there you go. Well, we'll see. I mean, so, you can always yeah. add on if you need to. So yeah, who knows? I, I mean, I will say the babies, they get really cute and you're like, shit, should I do another one? Right. She came out pretty good. I don't know. Right. I know the, the big decisions of life, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes, yeah. you know, good decisions to be making though. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> All right. Well, Kyle O'Reilly, it was an absolute pleasure talking to you. You are a gem of a human. Um, I'm mostly thrilled to find out that you have, uh, that you played Johnny Zuko. <laughs> Danny yeah. Zuko or Danny Zuko sorry oh my god I'm so stupid right now Danny the Zuko. pleasure is mine Renee thanks Loved for having it. me so much it was so great um yeah and can't wait to see you back on tv